Amen. Lovely to have you here. If you have your Bible, we're turning together to Second Peter, away at the end of the New Testament, just before the epistles of John. You'll come to Second Peter, Second Peter, and chapter three, please. Second Peter and chapter three, and we're just going to settle down before the Lord. Because we're sure that God, again, has something to uh, speak into all of our hearts this morning. Second Peter chapter 3. And if you find your place, just leave the Bible open there for a moment. Peter the Apostle, this man that spent three and a half years with the Lord Jesus... He watched him on the Mount of Transfiguration. He fell asleep when he was meant to be praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was there whenever Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. He was there whenever the Lord told him to cast his nets into the sea. And he brought a great multitude of fish. And experience after experience Peter had with God. He's now an old man. He's coming to the end of his life. And these last few chapters of 2 Peter are really the last words of a dying man. In chapter 1 he says, For I know that shortly I must put off the tabernacle of this body even as the Lord Jesus has showed me. And he's coming down now as an old man. And after all of his experience with God and after all of his ministry, he turns to the people of God again. And I want you to see some of the things that he says. Cast your eye at verse 3. He talks about the lateness of the hour. And you know, if you're in any way involved in reading your Bible, and if you're in any way in touch with God at all, you'll know that we today are living in a late hour. In verse 3 he says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days. That's where we are today. We're in the last days of the last days of this dispensation. Someone has said that we are no longer even in the last days, but we're in the last seconds. But he not only talks to them about the lateness of the hour, if you cast your eye to verse 9, he talks to them about the long-suffering of God. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness. But is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And here this old saint of God, he not only talks about the lateness of the hour, he not only talks about the, the long-suffering of God, but this is what we want to talk to you about this morning. He talks about the lifestyle of the saints. Because if you cast your eye to verse 11, he says, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be? Now that's my text this morning. It's a text that has burnt in my heart all week. What manner of persons ought we to be? Peter gives a very short answer and a very brief one. He goes on to say, in all holy conversation and godliness. And you know, my dear people, this morning, if you and I are saved and walking with the Lord, those are characteristics that ought to mark you and I as the people of God. We ought to be a holy people. Peter also said, be ye holy, for I am holy. He not only talked about being holy, he talked about being godly. And if there's any, any generation this morning that we need to see a generation of godly people, it is today. The psalmist could cry, help Lord, for the godly man ceases. He not only said about being holy, he not only talked about being godly, he also mentioned about being ready. Now I want you to cast your eye to verse 12. He said, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God. 
You know, John, in his epistle, he said that there'll be those, there'll be believers that when the Lord Jesus comes back, there'll be a certain group of people that will be ashamed at his coming. And I trust this morning as the people of God that we put our house in order and that we seek to live a holy and a godly life that whenever the Lord Jesus will come, whether it's at morn, whether it's at night, whether it's in the noonday, that you and I will not be ashamed at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can see this man of God, he talks about being holy. He talks about being godly. He talks about being ready. Now this morning, my message this morning is following on from the message last Sunday morning and last Sunday night. We heard last Sunday morning how to obtain the second rest. How to enter into that place of rest whenever we yield to the yoke of God. Where we get into the center of the will of the Lord, where we yield and surrender. And you've heard it preached so many times from this pulpit. Last Sunday night we talked about a personal revival. How is it that we can obtain a personal revival? How can I as an individual get closer to God? And I trust that's the desire of your heart as a believer this morning, not to see how much money you can make and not to see how popular you can become and not to see how many friends or how much of an influence you can have in the world, but that your goal would be and my goal would be that you and I would have a personal walk with God, that we would be intimate with him, that we would be like Enoch, that we would just simply walk with God. Now, I'm not going to go on with that this morning. I'm not talking to you this morning about how to obtain that. I want to talk to you this morning about how to maintain it. How do you and I as the believers, those that seek to go on with God, and how is it that when we have a personal revival, how is it that we, whenever we yield to God and put our all on the altar, how is it whenever we come into that vital, vibrant relationship with God, how do we maintain it? That's one of the most vital questions that you and I can ask as the people of God. Because whenever God moves in revival blessing, and thank God we believe that he will, we believe that God is going to move in revival blessing over these 32 counties of Ireland. I'm as sure as that is upon the shoes that I'm standing this morning. But how do we maintain that? How do you and I maintain a walk with God? Do we just simply say every day, Lord, I'm on the altar? Do we keep praying every moment of the day, Lord, I'm yielding, I'm yielding, I'm yielding? Is that all we are meant to do from now on? The answer to that is no. You and I as the people of God, when we enter into the rest and whenever we enter into the will of God, whenever we enter into that living relationship with him where we surrender and yield, my dear people, we have to progress. We have to go on. One of the last words, and cast your eye down to verse 18, of the Apostle Peter before he died, he said, but grow. And if there's ever a day today that we need people to grow in the Lord, it's today. Paul, whenever he was writing to the church at Ephesus, he said to grow up. And you and I as the people of God, we need to progress. And it's good every now and again to take a spiritual audit of our life. And whenever you businessmen come into January, February, March, you're thinking about getting your books already and you'll send it away to the accountant. But you and I as the people of God, it's good to take a spiritual audit and see have we been progressing with the Lord? Have we been moving on? Have we been taking ground with God? Now I want to talk this morning specifically to young families in the meeting. Because it's lovely to see you here and it's lovely to see the young people here. But I want to talk to you this morning primarily and you older people as well about how to maintain intimacy with God. How is it that we can walk with God, not just take a leap here and there, not just to be erratic, but be consistent in our walk with God. How is it that we can grow closer and closer to him day after day? And I know we'll have our ups and our downs, but to have an uphill climb where every day we learn more of him, where we hear more of his voice, where we get to grow more intimate with God. Whenever the M1 was built from Belfast, first of all to Lisbon in 1962, 
after that part of the motorway was built. There was little vans that used to drive up and down the road, and they're still there today. They're called the highway maintenance. And you know, as the people of God, we have to have highway maintenance. In Isaiah 53, it says that there shall be a highway and a way, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. And we need to learn how to maintain it. How is it that so many people of God, and how is it so many of us, we have those mighty experiences with God, and then after weeks or months, we lose ground. We're all in the prayer meeting, maybe for a few months, and then it seems to die. It seems to fizzle out. The desire seems to go. The passion seems to go. And maybe that's you even here this morning. You can look back to your recent days where you said, Lord, I used to enjoy the things of God far more than I am this morning. And that's why this message is so vital. How to maintain progress with God. I'm just going to lift that little word out of the Bible this morning. The little word ought. That speaks about responsibility. You parents, you'll know what it is whenever you say to your child, now you ought to do that. You ought to do this, or you ought to go here, or you ought to do that thing. It speaks of responsibility. And that's what Peter was saying in his epistle. He said, what manner of persons ought we to be? Whenever Paul was writing to young Timothy, in 1 Timothy 3 and 15, he says that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. And you and I, as the people of God, we need to discover that the church is not a man's church, that the church of Jesus Christ is the house of God. We can't do what we like in the house of God. I wouldn't allow you to come into my house. I would allow you to come in and sit in the front room. I would allow you to take your dinner. But there's a limitation to what you can do in my home. And so it is in the house of God. You and I, we don't rule the house of God. We don't run the house of God. This is God's house. And we need to know how we ought to behave ourselves whenever we're here. You remember the children of Issachar. The children of Issachar were marked by three very simple things. They were men of warfare. And they were men of weakness. It says that the children of Issachar were always crouched down between two burdens. But while the children of Issachar were men that were marked by warfare and marked by even the weight and the weakness of burdens, they were men that were marked by wisdom because it says of the children of Issachar that they had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. And you and I as the people of God, we need to rediscover that. And as I said last Sunday night, there's no real secrets to maintaining a walk with God. There's no real hidden secrets in the Bible. We just need to discover them. We just need to read the Scriptures, and we need to be like the Bereans who daily studied the Scriptures, and they searched the Word of God. And whenever you and I get into the Scriptures and say, Oh God, will you communicate to me? Will you tell me how to maintain a walk with God? My dear people, all we need to do is just get on our knees, open the Word of God, and He will show us. Lord, how do I maintain this? How do I maintain the life of rest? How do I maintain the victorious Christian living? How do I maintain a life of surrender? How do I maintain a life of personal revival? You'll remember whenever David went down into the valley of Elah, and there was a giant by the name of Goliath there. Whenever David went down into the valley, it says that he went down to the brook, and he lifted out of the brook five smooth stones. Those five stones are very important because Goliath had four brothers. That that brings you to five. And David knew that because of the five stones that he had in the shepherd's bag, he was able to deal with the enemy. He was able to deal with defeat. He was able to deal with discouragement. He was able to get the victory in the valley through five very simple stones. I want to give you five stones this morning that you can put into your shepherd's bag. Five stones that you can carry with you in order to maintain intimacy with God. They're very elementary. Maybe someone here after the meeting will come and you'll say, Stephen, you never told us something that we didn't hear before. Stephen, what you've told us this morning, we've been hearing it for years and that's so true. And so often it is that familiarity breeds contempt among us. But whenever you and I rediscover these five smooth stones, 
And one of the reasons why we haven't grasped them is one of the reasons why we don't seem to maintain any work that God does in our life. The first smooth stone that I want you to bring out of your shepherd's bag, the very smoothest of stones from the little brook, a stone that you and I will be able to maintain a walk with God and intimacy with Him, to hear His voice and to enjoy His presence. And who wouldn't want that? Is a word that many believers don't want to hear this morning. It's the word obey. To be obedient. In Acts chapter 5, whenever the apostles were standing before the council, and the council of the Sanhedrin bid them not to preach in the name of the Lord Jesus, and miraculously the Lord brought them out of the prison, and they went into the temple, and in the morning, the prison guards, they found them standing in the temple preaching exactly what they had been preaching the night before. And the council brought them before them and said, We charge you that you should not preach in the name of the Lord Jesus Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost and boldness, he stood before the, the council, and this is what he said. He said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And you know, my dear people, that's a very elementary truth. But one of the reasons why so few of God's people never seem to push on after having yielded, after having surrendered, after having those highs in the Christian life, and then it all seems to fizzle out, it all seems to die, it all seems to go in the back burner of life, it all comes down to this. There's been an area God has laid upon our heart, and we have never obeyed. The Bible says, and the hymn writer said, O trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. You take your Bible during the week and you go through some of the men and women in the Bible that made wrong decisions in life and they disobeyed God. And there was many consequences in their life just because they disobeyed. They didn't commit adultery. They didn't steal. All they did was disobey God. And whenever you and I get a conception in our heart that to disobey God is an awesome, awesome thing in the sense of the presence of the Lord. What about Adam? Adam walked in the cool of the day. Whenever God seemed to come near and in the cool of the day, he communicated with God and they walked together. And then Adam disobeyed. He took of the forbidden fruit and he lost fellowship with God. The one that he enjoyed so often. The one who talked to him and spoke to him. They must have talked about creation. They must have talked about the beautiful flowers. They must have talked about the perfection of all that God had done. And there was a day whenever Adam disobeyed God. And that fellowship was severed. And Adam was put out of the garden. Maybe that's you this morning. There was times whenever you had sweet fellowship with God. <laughs> but it's not there today. There's been an area of disobedience has crept in. What about Moses? Moses, the man of God, he disobeyed whenever he got the rod and he struck the rock. And I was just looking as I come up onto the pulpit this morning. Bertie left his stick here. <laughs> and I was thinking even as I come up, you know what, you know what Moses did? Just out of agitation and just out of, out of temper, he, he struck the rock. <laughs> he did it twice. God only told him to do it once. And because Moses was agitated and because he was annoyed, he struck the rock twice. And because of that one act of disobedience, he lost out on the blessing of God. I say again, he didn't get involved in drink. He didn't watch pornography. He just disobeyed God. And that's one of the areas that you and I need to be so careful with. What about Samson? Samson, the man of power, and he lost his power. He lost his vision because he disobeyed God. He got too close to the world. Samson lived in the border of Timnath, and he lost all that God gave him because of disobedience. What about Saul, the anointed king of Israel, the man who prophesied died with suicide? And there in Mount Gilboa, after a life of defeat and folly, he said, I have played the fool. And he got his spear and his sword and fell upon it. And he died the fool's death. The man that had the anointing of God. And I say again, you could have the anointing of God upon your life and God could come and that oil from heaven could flow upon you, but you can lose it because of disobedience. And Saul, whenever he was there, you remember how Samuel said to him, Samuel could say obedience is better than sacrifice for disobedience is a sin of witchcraft. 
I'm sure you and I wouldn't be too interested in playing the Ouija board. I'm sure there's some of you here would think it awful if someone was to say, I've been reading the horoscope. It's a form of witchcraft. But have we ever thought about disobedience? Because God said it's as a sin of witchcraft. What about Abraham? Abraham, the father of the faithful. Abraham, the one that was called out of the air of the Chaldees. My, how he disobeyed God and he took Hagar. And for 13 years, he never heard the voice of God. 13 years, the voice of God was silent towards Abraham because of disobedience. What about David? He lost his joy. What about Jonah? He lost his testimony. On and on we could go. Israel lost their liberty. All of these things that we lose out on because of areas of, and acts of disobedience. Whenever the Welsh revival was in full flight, and Evan Roberts, he never said where he was going to preach, and all the churches in Wales used to be packed. And Evan Roberts used to spend the whole night in prayer and he used to come and he used to come into the meeting and the meeting would be packed and he used to sit in the front row and he used to pray for three hours and the whole congregation would watch him. And then after three hours he would stand to his feet and he used to cry, Obey God, that's it my friend. Obey God. And whatever area God has been dealing with you and whatever area of your life God has been speaking to you about, Obey God. Obey God. You see, the Lord said in Isaiah 1 and verse 19, He said, If ye be willing, and so many of us are willing, but then He went on and said, And obedient. And the word obedience, we don't seem to like it. And I was thinking during the week, you know, there's even something within me. I don't like somebody saying to me, Stephen, you need to obey me. I don't like that. There's something of the old nature. There's something about sin. Never likes to be told what to do. And I'm sure you can identify with that. And whenever we hear that we need to obey God, we think of tyranny, we think of dictatorship. But every time you and I come to the place of obeying God, we think nothing of obeying the law. We think nothing of obeying our employer. We think nothing of obeying our husband or our wife. But whenever it comes to the things of God, how slow many of us are just to obey him. James, a half-brother of the Lord, he said, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. And Andrew Murray was a man that was mightily used by God whenever Andrew Murray walked the streets of South Africa. The whole street used to stop. Everybody used to stop and watch Andrew Murray walking down the road because he was radiant with the presence of God. And Andrew Murray was asked one day, he said, Sir, how is it that you have maintained a walk with God? And this is what he said. He said, Let every thought of mine be continually. How can I obey God today? How can we obey him? How is it that we can please our master by just doing what he tells us to do? And that's why John said, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. It was Eric Stewart that said a number of years ago, light obeyed brings light, but light rejected brings night. And so many God has spoken to you and there's an area in your life that hasn't been dealt with and you've tried to skirt around the edges and just like Saul, you've tried to bargain God by giving him sacrifice and you've tried to give him your money and you've tried to maybe pay missionaries and put money into the church collection and you've tried to bribe God by some other means but that act of disobedience is still there. And we need to learn to obey because light rejected brings night. We need to walk in the light as he is in the light. And one of the mighty proofs of salvation is not praying, although it's a lovely truth. A lovely evidence of salvation is not going to church or, or doing some religious activity. No, John says, hereby do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And one of the best ways to tell the world that you and I are saved is not to dress like a Christian. It's just to obey God just every day. Lord, what is it in my life that, that, that you want to teach me? What is it, Lord, that you want me to do? Where is it you want me to go? What area of the Word of God do I need to obey? Lord, you show that to me, and I will do that. You see, the Word of God is precious. The Word of God is permanent. It lasts forever. The Word of God, I can tell you, is powerful. It's sharper than two on the edge sword. We're to prove it, we're to preach it, but we're also to practice it. And whenever you and I obey the word of God, my dear people, that's it. That's the key. That's one of the stones in the bag of the shepherd that can bring victory. 
You remember many years ago, there was a film that was released, Back to the Future. But my dear people, as a church of Jesus Christ, all we need to do is get back to the Scriptures. Just get back to the Word of God. Just get down before the Lord and say, Lord, I want to obey in every area of your life, and I haven't got time to go into it. Some other time we'll preach on it. But we would need to obey the pattern of the church. This is the house of God, and God has set a pattern for it. And whenever Moses was making the tabernacle, my, it was there that God could say to him in Hebrews chapter 8, See that thou make it according to the pattern that I have showed thee. If you get your Bible and read through Acts chapter 2, you'll discover that there's seven blueprints to the church of Jesus Christ. They were saved. They were baptized. They were added to the church membership. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. And my dear people, that's it. And so many of us, we pick and choose. We have the allied cart. We'll do this. We'll do that. We'll, we'll commit to this, but we'll not commit to that. And we want the blessing of God. And we pray, Lord, bless us and revive us. Lord, will you use us? And all the time God is saying, just obey me. <laughs> just obey me. Not only in the pattern of the church, but in the principles of life. We need to obey God in our marriage. We need to obey God with our finances. We need to obey God in how we deal with one another and our conduct. Just simply obey him. We need to obey God in the specifics of his will. Whenever Paul was standing before King Agrippa, he said to King Agrippa, Oh, King, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. In other words, he said, King Agrippa, everything that God has told me to do, I've done it. Oh, that we would be obedient. Now, I want to know what's in your life that God wants you to obey. It's very well looking at Abraham and Moses and, and Adam and all of these men in the Scriptures and Jonah, but what about you and I? What is it that you and I need to obey? What is it that you and I need to come in line with? Whenever Abraham Roberts was praying, he used to pray four hours a day for 13 years for revival. Whenever Evan Roberts got onto his bed, his bed shook with the presence of God. And he used to lie for four hours. And one of the prayers he prayed was, Oh God, bend me. Bend me in line with your word, Lord. Bend me in line with your word. And whenever you and I as the people of God, and I want to encourage you this morning, come in line with his word. Come in line with the word of God. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Just obey him. One of the most solemn things in the gospel, and I think we've lost sight of this. We often say that the spirit of God will not always strive with men, and that is true. But it's also true of the believer. Because whenever God lays an area in our life that we need to obey and we make a conscious decision not to obey it, he withdraws. He's nothing more to say. He doesn't speak until we obey. And maybe there's an area in your life and there was a moment when God told you to obey, whether it's baptism, whether it's remembering the table, whether it's coming into members, whatever it may be, whatever area it may be of your life. And God knows that you haven't obeyed and he has never spoken since. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Just obey God. And maybe he's told you to put things right in your life. Maybe there's an area of restitution and there's someone that you need to apologize. And God has laid an area in your life upon the altar. And he says, I need you to deal with that. And you say, Lord, I can't do it. I don't want to do it, Lord. My reputation is at stake. He has nothing more to say. The voice of God will fall silent. And the man who brought the Scotland Yard into existence, Sir Robert Anderson, he wrote a book on the silence of God. And whenever we disobey him, God has nothing more to say. And I fear, I fear over so many believers. They come to ministry meetings and they know the word of God. And they would argue, if I was to read out of an NIV or an ESV, they would say, Stephen, that translation of the Bible is words missing. And you're wrong to use it. But so often we don't cut the word of God out. We leave it out. And if we leave the word of God out, I want to tell you, my dear people, disobedience brings a barrier to God. And if you're here this morning and you're going with someone and you're involved in a, a relationship and you're not married and you need to be married, let me tell you what you need to do. Just obey God. And if you owe money, obey him. <laughs> there's no secrets to it. Just obey God. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. 
Another stone that we would need to have in our shepherd's bag is the words of the Lord Jesus. And Lord Jesus said in Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, he said, men ought always to pray, to talk to God. <laughs> and I think of nothing greater than a man or woman can do as a believer than talk to God. There's nothing that excites my heart more. And the Lord knows this as I say this before you this morning. There's nothing that excites my heart more than being able to talk to God. To come into that place where I can actually communicate to the one who created the world. Where he talks to me and I can talk to him and prayer is not a monologue. Prayer is a dialogue where he speaks and I speak to him. We can hear his voice and it can be a voice of comfort. It can be a voice of correction. It can be a voice of reassurance. But oh, my dear people, how we starve ourselves of intimacy with God. And then we wonder how to maintain it. Have you got a quiet time? Have you got a place where you just get alone with God? Now, I know, I know that you mothers are busy. I, I watch Charlotte with little Emily, and I know that is not easy. I know that's hard. I know there's times when you get down to read and pray and the demands of family, you can get agitated. I am aware of that. But I want to encourage you to spend a little time every day with God. Whether it's 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever you can do, spend time with God. I'll tell you what I used to do. Whenever I got saved and after that lovely experience and New Year's Eve that we talked about last, year, last week, I used to set the first five minutes of every hour just to talk to God. From the top of the hour to five past, just those five minutes just to stop and just talk to God. You don't have to get on your knees. You don't have to raise your hands just to communicate to heaven. And whenever you and I come in contact with God, where we spend time with him, where we grow in intimacy with him, the Lord Jesus said, when you pray, go into the closet and shut the door. And your heavenly Father, which seeth thee in secret, shall reward thee openly. I want to ask you this morning, my dear people, when was the last time you were in contact with God? You see, man is a three-part being. He's body, soul, and spirit. We know what the body is for. We know what the soul is. The soul is the real us. But what is the spirit? What is it? The spirit is dead because of sin. And whenever you and I get saved, the Bible says that he quickens our spirit. We're made alive. That spirit is the, the act of communication between God. It's like an, a, like an antenna. You see the big antenna on a radio or up on top of the mountain in Cookstown, and it picks up a signal. And whenever you and I get saved, our spirit is made alive and we can come in contact with God. We can communicate to him. We can bring our desires and our wants and our ambitions all before him. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Psalm 23, the psalmist David said, My cup runneth over. I don't know if you've ever studied that, but I can tell you it's a mighty, mighty blessing because whenever you went into a Jewish house and you went in for a little cup of time of fellowship and you were sitting together at food and the, the host would come and he would take the cup and if he was to fill it just as much as it's filled here, half filled, you know what he was saying? He was saying, I don't mind you being here, but you need to go after a little period of time. I don't mind you coming and having a little fellowship together, maybe an hour or two or a couple of hours, but there's a limitation to your friendship. And the more that the host would fill the cup, he was saying, I want you to stay longer and longer. The psalmist David said, my cup runneth over. The old Hebrew word is this, he floods the cup. In other words, God wants to have intimacy with us as much as we can with him. And so often we're so busy. So often we're so taken up with other things and we forfeit the blessing of God. I would love to be there whenever Enoch walked with God and talked with him and the creator, the sustainer, and spoke to him. I'd love to be there whenever Adam was there, whenever Abraham was in the plain of Mamre, whenever Moses sat and went into the tent and it says that he spoke to God face to face as a friend speaketh of a friend. And my dear people, so many of us, God waits upon us in the morning he waits upon us during the day. I wonder, will she come and see me today? I wonder, will he come and visit me? I wonder, will he have fellowship with me? And he waits, and he waits in vain. We, we're so busy with the television, with work, with family, with the business, and, and we lose out in God. That's it. You see, we want revival to do God, for God to do everything for us. But we need to know how to maintain it. Joe prayed for his family. 
Hezekiah prayed for his health. Daniel prayed for the nation. Hannah prayed for the burden of our heart, and that's why Paul said that he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. And James says we have not because we ask not. R.A. Torrey was a man that was mightily used by God. His Sunday school teacher was agitated because young people in his class wasn't getting saved, and the Lord laid it upon his heart to take one young man in prayer and pray him through. And he used to get up in the middle of the night just for 15, 20 minutes and he used to bring R.A. Tory before the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, would you save this young man, Tory? Will you make him a man of God? And one night, whenever the Sunday school preacher, Sunday school teacher was on his knees praying, R.A. Tory, who was in his bed many miles away, he just woke up, flooded with conviction. He got out of his knee, out of his bed and got onto his knees and he was saved by the grace of God. Oh, my dear people. We need to rediscover the art of prayer. And whatsoever ye ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive, and hitherto you've asked nothing in my name. Ask that your joy may be full, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, and if our hearts condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask of him, we shall receive. Is that one of the reasons why we, we go up and down? Is that one of the reasons why we can't seem to maintain it? And R.A. Torrey went on to say how little the average Christian spends in prayer. We are too busy to pray, and so we accomplish little for God. May we retrace, go back to the place of prayer. May we rediscover the power of prayer. May we be men and women that will give ourselves lock, stock, and bar to the ministry of crying unto God. That's just a little simple stone to use to maintain Intimacy with God. Time has beaten me this morning. I'll give you the last three as we close, but there's not only the little stone of obeying God, obey God. And there's not only the stone of prayer, we ought to pray. John says we ought to love one another. He didn't say we ought to like one another. <laughs> if I was standing in the front of Ballycleal Church whenever I was getting married to Charlotte, and I turned to her before I put the ring on and said, you know, I, I like you, but I don't love you. <laughs> I think I would be a single man today. And so many of us, we say, well, as believers, we just have to like one another. The Bible says we need to love one another. To have a love for one another. My, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. I need you. You need me. And we're the body. And oh, the cry of my heart would be, Lord, give us that agape love, that love that is kind and suffereth long, that, that love that vaunteth not itself, is not easily puffed up, believeth all things, beareth all things, hopeth all things. And this love never fails. We need to have the stone of love. We need to have the stone of obedience. We need to have the stone of prayer. And then Paul went on to say, you ought to forgive one another. And that's a mighty truth as the people of God. And as we come to a close this morning, one of the greatest hindrances among the people of God is the lack of forgiveness. Someone maybe has said something or done something and someone maybe has hurt you, but you never seem to forgive. The old Latin word there is paraneo. It's the word to pardon without reserve in the Saskatoon revival. That was one of the outstanding features whenever God broke out among the people of God. People that had contention in their heart, hidden down, unseen to anyone else, they came out and they said, brother, I have something against you, sister. I'm, I'm holding a grudge. And they brought it all out before God. And God moved in blessing. Forgive. He gives and gives and giveth again. The father had to forgive the prodigal son. Spent all his money. Ruined his reputation whenever the prodigal son was coming back. My, the father ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. He put the ring on his finger, the best robe on his back and sandals on his feet. And maybe there's a father here and you would need to forgive your son. He's maybe hurt you in the past. He's maybe said something about you. Forgive. And then, of course, there was Job had to forgive his friends. He was wounded in the house of his friends. His friends were physicians of lies and forgers of no value. But it says whenever Job prayed for his friends that God turned Job's captivity. And my dear people, if you have a grudge in your heart against a friend or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or some relationship, you'll need to forgive you need to let it go before God because then progress comes. Joseph had to forgive his brothers. They sold him. They denied him. They rejected him. And whenever he came, he forgave them. 
Hosea had to forgive his wife. She went and committed adultery. She broke the marriage bond and he was a broken-hearted man. She was unfaithful to him. And yet he had to forgive her. And how much God has forgiven you and I. I read the story recently of a man who had unforgiveness in his heart against a friend. He was a, he was a very famous man in the very town where this individual lived. They erected a statue. <laughs> And every day he had to come out and he looked at the friend, the statue, and he was filled with unforgiveness and bitterness in his heart. And what he did, he was so overwhelmed with unforgiveness and bitterness and grief. At night he used to get out when everyone else in the town was in bed. He got a little hammer and a little chisel and he used to go out and tap, tap, tap. He took a little inch away here and a little inch away there. Night after night he went out and he chiseled away at the man that he hated. And one night he hit the last blow of the chisel and the statue fell and killed him. And that's exactly what unforgiveness will do to any Christian. It'll kill your spirituality. It'll kill your walk with God. And if you come to the altar and you discover that you've ought against their brother, leave your gift and go and first be reconciled and then come and offer your gift unto the Lord. We ought to pray. That's how we maintain it. Talk to God. Bring it all before him. Communicate. Come into that living, vital relationship with God where we spend time with God. No secret. We need to not only pray, but we would need to love one another. We need to forgive one another. But the last little stone is a tremendous stone. Because it was said of the woman at the well whenever she was there in John's Gospel, chapter 4. And she wasn't even saved. And you know what she said? She said to the Lord Jesus in John's Gospel, chapter 4, men ought to Worship God. And you know, my dear people, that's a wonderful thing to do. To worship God. If you ever get a chance, buy the book by A.W. Tozer, The Worship Driven Life. Whenever you and I, we, we don't ask anything and we don't come into his presence to get anything, but we just come to worship him. We come like the wise men, where is he who is born, king of the Jews, for we have seen his star in the east and we have come to worship him. And the first mention of worship in your Bible is whenever Abraham went up Mount Moriah and he brought his son, his only son. It's the first time you'll, you'll find the word love. And he brought the son that he loved and laid him on the altar. And he came to give God an offering. It was an offering well pleasing unto him to worship God, just to be bask in his presence, to lose sight of everything else and all of the burdens and just be taken up with him. The lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. You know what's sad, and with this I close, the smallest meeting in the church is the worship meeting. I'll see many of you there on Wednesday night, and thank God for that, because it's lovely to pray. (laughs) I'll see many of you tonight in the school, but I'm going to see a lot of you leave this morning, because all we want to do is worship. Just remember him. To be taken up with the love of God and I can't understand it. Who is a pardoning God like thee? Or who is grace so rich and so free? And so many of us people of God, we say, Lord, I'm glad that you died for me. I'm glad that you shed your blood. I'm glad that you went through all of that for me. But I don't really care this morning. All I'm interested in is my sins are forgiven and I'm on my way to heaven, but I don't really want to worship you. I'll just go home and get my dinner. And I know it's not possible for everyone to stay. I don't mean that. But my dear people, that's one of the keys and that's one of the reasons why so few maintain intimacy with God. We don't obey. There's no secret to it. We don't pray as as we ought to. We don't love one another as we should. We don't forgive and we don't don't worship. Now I've got one more question for you and then we're going to close in a hymn. Is that why you're not maintaining a walk with God? Is that why your Christian experience is erratic? Is that why there's little areas in your life where you you pull back and you go forward and maybe there's times of refreshing and then you, you seem to lose it all? Well, you take those five stones and put them into your shepherd's bag that you and I would maintain the highway of holiness, intimacy, intimacy with God.